So hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our safety webinar entitled The Forging Process, Manufacturing Heavy Duty Hooks for Lifting Applications. In this webinar, we will cover the process used to forge heavy duty lifting hooks, including bar heating, preforming, forging, cleaning, and die testing. We'll also provide an overview of DIN and ASME requirements regarding design and related applications. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the eMarketing Specialist at Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. Presenting today will be Tim Lewis, Columbus McKinnon's Business Development Manager. Also on the call to be taking questions is Troy Raines. He's our Chain and Rigging Product Engineering Manager at Columbus McKinnon. As I said earlier, we are recording the session today and the recording link will be added to our YouTube channel. All in attendance will receive a link to our recording. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A pane on the right side of your page. We'll take, like I said, five or 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. As a side note, after each webinar, we select one of the questions to be used in our blog the following week. If your question is chosen, we'll send you a Columbus McKinnon promotional item. Something really fun, I think, like uh, maybe a polo shirt, hat, work gloves. I think last month we sent a, uh, a backup charger for a cell phone with our logos on it. So send us your questions and then we'll notify the winner uh, after the fact. So thank you for your attention and now I'll turn the meeting over to Tim so we can begin. Tim? Thanks, Gisela. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. As Gisela mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, forging, the forging process. Uh, you know, uh, some discussion about some uh, shank hooks, big shank hooks, little shank hooks. Uh, just in general uh, about our forging process and what we make and, and how we make it. Um, as everyone knows, uh, the information uh, that we're going to present today to, is uh, intended for general information purposes only. Uh, it's not a substitute for any uh, applicable government app regulations or standards. Should you uh, need additional information, please feel free to uh, contact uh, anyone from Columbus McKinnon in the training department, myself or Troy Raines, and we'll uh, help you or point you in the right direction. Okay. <clears throat> we'll start today talking about casting versus forging. Excuse me, Tim, really quick. I want to do a polling question, okay, just to get things started. So we just want to gauge your, gauge your feedback here. Let me see if it has started. Okay, I'm going to launch. I'm sorry, Tim. I just wanted to run this in there quick. So what do you think is better, a cast or a forged shank hook? And you can vote. If you're on an iPad, you won't be able to vote. Um, but if not, just please go ahead and let us know. Cast or forged? We'll give it another couple seconds. All right, Tim, we are at about 95% say forged. Oh, it's at 90% forged, 10% cast. Okay. All right, uh, that's 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 great. Uh, let's talk about them, and, and everyone can form their own opinion. First of all, let's define the casting and a forging. What is a casting? The casting is a, a manufacturing process by which a liquid is poured into a mold or a cavity. Then it it sets and cools off and is allowed to solidify. A forging, similar in shape at the final stages, is, is manufactured a little bit different. Uh, the forging is a process by which you heat a metal, you put that metal into a type of press uh, or manual press or open die press or various different presses, you actually compress that metal into a cavity. It's normally inside of a die, of course. Okay. Now the computer will not forward here. It's not going? It's not moving. Okay, I'll tell you what. I will, uh, I'll take over then presenting. Just one minute. Okay, now we got it. Oh, you got now it? We got it. Okay, perfect. Casting versus forging, yes. Columbus McKinnon uses a forging process uh, to manufacture most all of our, uh, our products. Uh, we do use it to produce all of our forgings that are used for overhead lifting. Those include the heavy-duty crane hooks uh, manufactured uh, here in the U.S. in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as well as our crane hooks manufactured in Hong, Germany at our STB location. We use a forge process for our club lock hooks. We use a forge process for our eye hooks, as well as the hammer locks, even our carbon hooks, even our load binders. 
Now you will find a lot of these different products out in the market today that are either forged or cast. More especially crane hooks, a lot of the larger capacity crane hooks you will find cast. A lot of load binders you will find cast. Columbus McKinnon uses for the forging process to manufacture all of these products as well as a lot of other products. As I earlier stated, Columbus McKinnon not cast any of their products used in the rigging industry today as far as uh, the rigging products themselves. So uh, why forging not a casting? Now forging is much stronger. Why is it stronger? Uh, it maintains its uh, consistency and strength. It has a consistent grain flow. It has directional strength. And uh, you can uh, see metal metallurgical defects in a forging process a little bit better than you can a casting process. If you look at photographs on the right side of the screen, you'll see the difference in the grain structure of a forge versus a casting. You will notice in, in the forging uh, photograph at the top there how all of the little lines are going in one direction. Down at the bottom, you see uh, the, uh, the, the little lines are, are not in one direction, and there's a lot of, of variety of what direction they're going. Now, what causes that? If you refer back to what I, I said earlier uh, on the other slide, you pour this in. So as you're pouring, you know, air pockets can pick up. And uh, it just doesn't have anything compressing that product down. It's a liquid pour into a cavity. Uh, so why forging not a casting? Reliability. Uh, the grain, uh, grain pattern in the forging is much more defined and much more structured. Uh, the forging maximizes the strength uh, by producing a grain flow orientation. Uh, a outside study has been done on uh, casting versus forging, not only for rigging products, but for other products. And what the study has found that typically a forge is, uh, has a 26% higher tensile strength than a casting. Uh, also, the study has found that most forge products, uh, they have a 37% uh, fatigue strength over the casting products, which in a lot of cases results in a uh, five to one, six to one, seven to one, or even greater design factor for your forging versus your casting. Uh, we'll get into that in a, a little bit later here. Um, just a photograph of, uh, of what a forging looks like once it's pulled uh, pulled to destruction. Uh, this is this is a standard bow shackle, a BNC shackle, bolt nut and cotter shackle, and and you can see that doesn't even look like a shackle. What has happened? Uh, we have destroyed this shackle. Uh, actually, another company destroyed it for us, I think. And you can see it's just stretched out. Uh, it just really stretches. It really elongates well. Uh, some of the uh, some of the um, tests that have been done outside have, have seen as much as a 58% um, reduction in the area when when it's pulled to failure versus a 6% on a cast product. As we all know, we, we've seen different cast parts, cast bolts. Uh, you know, they're they're easily broken, and and the reason they are is they don't have that ductility and can stretch out like a forging does. This all relates back to the grain flow. How that grain flow is flowing, you're just stretching that material as you're as you're stretching it out. You want good elongation. You want to be able to see that your part is failing before it fails. Thus, there's elongation requirement for a lot of products in our rigging industry. Uh, cost benefit. That's another reason a forging is, is a better product than a casting, uh, in Columbus McKinnon's opinion. The four, uh, forged products are, are less prone to uh, internal defects. Uh, there's fewer inspections required because the forging is a compressed uh, product. Um, on, a, on a casting, you actually have to do x-rays to see if there's any, any internal defects. Um, you know, the forging product is all compressed down, so really uh, you can't x-ray the forge, but uh, there's typically no need for the x-ray unless you have something catastrophic that has happened in your process. Uh, you have higher productivity with forgings. Uh, you can set up a forge hammer and just uh, what we, we call in the forge, forge uh, industry, heat and beat all day long and pour them out. Now compare that to pouring a liquid into a, a mold, you could quickly understand, you know, the difference in the, the higher productivity. Uh, you have larger production runs with your forging process. Uh, your production rates are higher because of things I've just mentioned. Uh, typically have less scrap because you do have less imperfections, and it's a much faster process in the forging process, allowing for shorter lead times. 
Uh, the conclusion of the cast versus the forging, the forging process does produce a more consistent grain flow pattern, uh, which gives you a better strength to weight ratio as compared to a cast product, giving you a smaller profile, also giving the user a, a cost benefit at the end. Uh, when comparing the size, the weight, and overall dimensions of a cast versus the forge, in almost every case, your forge took will be smaller. Now, what does that do for you? Well, think about building a, a chain sling. Think about building a wire rope sling. Think about adding products to your crane. The less weight you can take off, the better. The less cumbersome it is for rigging. So it, it's all about uh, the, the higher quality product, the lighter weight product, and the cost benefit to our users. Uh, Tim? Yes. Tim, we have a question, and I'm going to go ahead and ask it now because it's kind of tying into what you're saying. How do you guarantee or how do we guarantee the grain flow in ram's horn hooks? Single hook grain flow is logical, but a ram's horn hook grain flow might not be so logical. Well, if, uh, if you will hold that thought, I've got a photograph here in a couple of minutes about grain flow that, that might help explain it. It's actually in the same thing. It pushes the grain, it pushes the material out in all the different directions as we're dropping the hammer down on it. But I got a photograph that might have explained that in just a moment. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, a simple way to think about grain flow in a cast versus a forging is uh, the hot molten liquid is poured into a cavity, uh, which is poured in slowly, fills the cavities very easily, and it's filled all the way from the bottom to the top. Where in a forge, we actually heat the, the bar or the steel, we lay it on a hammer, either either uh, uh, on an open die or a closed die or a hybrid type hammer uh, that has somehow cavities, some do not, and we actually press that down into the steel. So now you're you're taking that metal, you're pressing it down, you're making the metal flow as that hammer hits the top of that steel, you're pressing it into that cavity, and that metal is flowing all through your cavity as you're laying it down. Uh, the hammer is moving the material all in one direction with force. So keep in mind, you start out with a, a round piece. We'll, we'll use for an example. It can be square. It can be rectangle. But start out with a round piece, and you're just going to have presses that are coming down and pressing that into that cavity. So you're pushing your material through the process. Uh, there's really no visual differences between a cast and a forge. You, some people can, can look at a cast and say, oh, man, that, that's a cast there. In some instances, they may, they may have some air pockets have a little bit rougher finish. But, you know, if a forging is rotoblasted, it can also have a rough finish. So it's really really not that visible to see. Uh, but, but with the proper grain flow, what you're going to do is you're going to have a better fatigue strength. You're going to have improved ductility. You know, when you're applying pressure to it, you're going to get stretched. You're not going to get break. And, and the forge product's, uh, product's going to be tougher. It's going to be a... Uh, a very tough product to be used in the field. Uh, the optimum grain flow uh, is achieved when the maximum stress is aligned with the grain flow lines. Now there is a way to measure uh, grain flow and we use the ASTM standard of E381 to measure the grain flow in, in the products. Uh, once again, photograph of uh, grain flow in a forging versus photo a photograph of the grain flow in the casting. Uh, much tighter consistency, one direction in the flow. Now this is uh, very similar to to the rounds horn hook. It's not the not the exact shape, but you will see as you as you're as you're pressing down that metal is flowing all in one direction. It's not flowing side to side. It's keeping one direction of flow. Uh, that's not the photograph I was mentioning, but we do have one here. There we go. Uh, as you can see, this is an actual uh, profile of a hook that's been forged and, and we've cut it half in two. If you notice at the top, uh, that's typically where your bar is. Uh, you press the bar down. You can see the, the structure is coming down. It's flowing out into the legs. This is very similar to what the uh, ram's horn hook would be. It would flow out into the legs. Once again, the ram's horn hook is a, is a uh, forged product. It's not a cast product. So we're, we're using a very similar process uh, forging that rounds horn hook as we would even a, a 12 lock hook at the Chattanooga facility. We're heating metal, we're pressing it into the cavity, we're pressing it outward. So the conclusion on grain flow, pardon me, Troy? Excuse me, Troy would like to speak now. Go ahead, Troy. 
one of the keys to that grain flow is the preform. Um, you actually change the orientation of the part to reorient the grain flow during the foraging process, and then you bring it back to the other plane to beat it. Okay, thanks, Troy. So the conclusion on grain flow, uh, the, the forage product does give a more consistent grain flow structure than the cast product. The consistency of the grain flow does provide a, a higher quality part. Uh, it does provide a, a elongation in most all forage parts, uh, giving the user a more durable, longer lasting product uh, for his use in his everyday rigging processes. Okay, Tim, at this time, I'm going to ask yeah. another polling question, okay? So okay. Let me launch it here. And the question is, does a number 10 shank hook have only one capacity, yes or no? So again, does a number 10 shank hook have only one capacity? What do you think? Looks like we're at about, let's wait till about 60% of voted. Let's see. Okay, it looks like we're at about 75, 25. 25 say yes. 75 say no. Can you tell us the answer? Sure. We, we, we will discuss the uh, working load limits of, of various hooks. Um, with our acquisition of STB, STB is a company that's been in business well over 100 years, and, and they have been manufacturing shank hooks for a great number of those years. Uh, with the manufacturing of shank hooks, uh, they also manufacture various other forgings, I might add. But with the, uh, with the manufacturing of shank hooks more specifically, uh, they have been a, a key player in developing numerous standards over there. Now let's think about a little bit about that number 10 shank hook we just talked about. Uh, I'm sure most of the guys on the, on the call today are familiar with CMAA load charts. Uh, CMAA is a, um, a specification used by crane builders to identify the capacities of the cranes. Um, we want to talk about how that relates back to a shank hook that meets a DIN standard. Uh, drive groups are a key element in, in DIN standards. Uh, what a drive group is, is the dynamic stress applied on a hook when it's in operation. It's a uh, drive group is very similar to CMAA load charts. Uh, the drive group was established uh, by DIN. Uh, it's actually as per DIN 15020 standards. And what the drive group does, it gives you a, uh, a element of change based on how your crane and or your hook is being used. Uh, it's based on duration of daily operation. It's based on the weight of the load you're picking up. It's based on how many times you're picking that load up. Uh, it's based on are you holding the load. It has very uh, several different applications that you have to consider when you're choosing the correct hook for your application. Uh, drive groups consist of three categories uh, as per DIN 15020. There is a moderate, which is a low frequency of maximum load. There is a middle, which is a equal uh, frequency of small loads, mid-sized loads, and maximum loads. And how long, uh, how many times per hour you're picking these up. Then there's a heavy uh, description, which is a constant maximum load lifting and how many times you're picking that up. And depending, depending on how you're using your crane will depend on what the capacity of that 10-ton hook is. Uh, if you notice that most shank hooks, uh, the European shank hooks, do not have a uh, capacity forged into the hook. It's all dependent upon the designer of the crane to rate the crane pen, pending on how uh, how that crane is going to be used in daily operations. So yes, a 10 ton shank hook can have more than one capacity depending on the usage of the hook. Or I'm sorry, the usage of the crane. Let's talk a little bit about open die forge versus closed die forging. Uh, an example of forging can be as simple as a hammer, an anvil, and a furnace. You heat metal, you lay it on an anvil, you take a hammer and you start beating it out. Now, keep in mind that, that that piece of metal is one inch thick. As you're taking that hammer and putting blows onto that piece of metal, you're making it expand at the bottom. So you're you're actually doing a forge process with the with the hammer and the an, uh, anvil. Uh, 
the blacksmithing uh, has been around for way more years than than probably any of us can imagine. Uh, back into the uh, to the early 17, 1800s when there was fire and there was metal, you know, you heated up and you made what you needed. Uh, blacksmith was sort of known as an open die process because you had that hammer and the anvil there and you're just beating out into the shape that you need. Uh, in the open die process, the, the metal is just laid on a flat die surface and, and its thickness is decreased by compression forces. You know what? Same thing that happens on our forge presses. Um, we're talking about a hammer and an anvil, but our forge press does the same thing. You lay a flat piece of metal in there, it compresses it, it runs it out into your cavity or your die. Um, you know, on an open die, which we do have uh, some open die presses as well as what we, we call hybrid die, some open, some close, and one die set. Um, you're basically reducing the thickness of that metal and making it wider or running it into your cavities. Uh, closed die process is very similar to an open die process, but only the closed die process has a has a complete enclosed cavity that once you put that hot metal on top of that die, the press comes down and presses into it. It all stays right inside the die. Your flashover will run out between your two dies, and you trim that off. Um, in in the open die press, very similar. You, you press it down, you press it down, you press it till you get the form you want, then you trim it in the manner you want. The, the closed die press is, is just a, uh, a faster, more economical way versus an open die press that may have to do some extra trimming because you do, are not running into that cavity. Now, one thing that Columbus McKinnon does at our uh, STB facility, we have, uh, I guess, what you would call a hybrid type uh, press over there. It has a closed eye on one end and an open eye on one end. That allows us to build uh, either single or, or double shank hooks with very extended shafts at the end of them. A closed eye forging, uh, it, you know, it just forces the metal uh, through the grain flow. As you're seeing on this picture here, these are all closed eye forge uh, hooks that you see there. You know, we lay a piece of metal on a forge hammer. Uh, the metal has been heated to probably 2,000 degrees, maybe even 2,500 degrees. I'm not sure of the temperature. We come down with the hammer press, it presses it right into a cavity. You see the single hooks on the left and the double hooks on the right. So these are all a closed eye forge process. Uh, both of the uh, closed eye and open eye uh, forge processes are performed in various different steps. As Troy was mentioned earlier in his comment there, uh, you, you sort of start doing some preforming up front to get that, that larger end, maybe ball it up in a process, or when the hammer comes down, it's going to press it out. The photograph you see here is, is a, a closed eye process, as you can see a cavity laying in there. Um, you know, it, it's basically forging process is heating material, uh, placing in a forge, dropping the hammer, then trimming the part off. Uh, most of your smaller capacity hooks up to about a, a 40 ton on the shank hooks or maybe a 30 ton on the shank hooks, they're performed in a closed die press. When you get larger than that, we we'll go to an open die, open die or hybrid type press. Once again, the hybrid type press allows us to form the shape of the hook at the bottom, but run the shank out as long as we need to run the shank out to fit the customer specifications. With modern day forging process, uh, it's very simple to, to uh, forge complex uh, geometries. Uh, that requires little or no need for additional finishing. At both of our forge uh, locations in Chattanooga and in Hamm, Germany, uh, we manufacture a lot of OEM parts, especially parts for customers. Uh, some examples are uh, uh, at uh, Hamm, Germany, we actually manufacture a crankshank for the uh, Army tanks. Um, to give you a little idea, and, and this will date back into cast versus forging as well, years ago, how long did a car engine last? maybe 60, 70,000 miles, a lot of those parts were cast. In today's modern uh, modern technology and ability to form a very tight tolerance and a tight complex geometry forging, a lot of your car parts now are made out of forgings. How many miles will those engines run today? You know, nothing uncommon for them to run two, 300,000 miles. So the process has improved over the years. A lot of uh, manufacturers have, have left castings and gone over into forgings. But, you know, the forging dates back to the blacksmithing days. Um, you know, there's uh, the blacksmith, they can make a very complex 
geometry. It may take days to do it. It may take multiple reheats to do it. But with the uh, with today's CNC equipment that you can cut your own dies in house, you can sink your own dies in house. Uh, it's very common for very complex geometries to be made on the on the open die forge today, or the closed die forge more especially. Uh, Tim. Troy would like to make yes. a quick comment, uh, just really quick, if you'd like, Troy, about the, uh, sure. you know, why, well, about forging and casting. Uh, Troy, go ahead. Well, I've always found it pretty interesting that there are so many um, large rigging products that are cast. And I, I got to asking around why that was, you know, because obviously there's a potential for internal defects, there's uh, less strength, less um, grain orientation, grass, greater grain size, all things that you wouldn't really desire in a rigging product. Come find out, most people just don't have a big enough hammer to forge the large stuff. And uh, with the acquisition of STB, we now have um, hammers among the world's biggest. So we have a, a bigger rigging hook forging capacity than anybody else around. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Troy. I think what Troy is trying to say is hammer time. <laughs> so I uh, <clears throat> date myself a little bit, but anyway, maybe everybody got it. Uh, conclusion on open die and closed die forging, um, they both have their benefits, uh, and, and they do have their drawbacks too. Uh, you know, a drawback on the open die forge, you, maybe you can't forge the uh, as large a uh, product as you need, just like Troy had mentioned there. Uh, we do use both open die and closed die at Columbus McKinnon. We also use a hybrid between a mix of two. Uh, the open die from Forge allows uh, allows us to uh, offer a shank hook with uh, with extended lengths. That's open die slash hybrid. We do we do forge the end of the hook into the the closed die, and then the hybrid it, it just runs it out all the way. So if you got a customer that needs a shank hook that has uh, a a uh, 36 inch uh, 36 inch shaft on it, guess what? We can manufacture that. Uh, we do a lot of closed die forging. All of our forging in Chattanooga is closed die forge unless it's especially OEM. Then we can make some open die modifications if necessary. The open die can be as simple as, you know, a, a press on a, on a flat steel without a cavity as well. Uh, inspection of crane hooks. Uh, the standard for inspection of crane hooks is very similar to that of, of any other rigging product. Uh, examples of, of what to look for in the uh, in the hooks are, you know, the worn hooks, the twisted hooks, uh, nicks, gouges, cuts, malfunction latches, securing mains, uh, throat openings are they stretched out. Uh, typically follow guidelines ASM B, uh, ASM E B30.10 uh, for the full inspection criteria. The criteria for the STB crane hooks, uh, we follow the uh, inspection criteria is set forth in DN 15405 part 1 which reads in part for single and double hooks takes effect now this is a German translation so the wording looks a little crazy uh, for single and double hooks takes effect at more than 5% of wire dimension in H2 which is actually in the throat of your hook down there uh, if it's more than 5% wire then then it's time to, to consider replacing the hook that uh, concludes our presentation for today. Um, so if there's any questions at this point, uh, we're open to take questions. Gisa, do you have any questions on um, the board? I do. Really quick, can we go back to the question that you asked? Um, it was a polling question about a number 10 shank hook having only one capacity. You don't have to go back to it. That was just a polling okay. question. Um, can you explain a little bit about that? Because, like I said, it was kind of split between yes and no, and I know Troy wants to add a comment to that as well. Go ahead and add your comment to it. Or could we have a number 10 hook made out of either a carbon or an alloy material? Yes, absolutely. They could be made out of a different material. It could also be made out of stainless or bronze, which will change the working capacity of it as well. Uh, typically on a carbon hook, uh, on air shank hooks, a carbon hook is actually, uh, we'll say that the capacity is, is uh, 10 ton. That same number 10 hook, the capacity of made in alloy is going to be uh, 20 ton. Uh, once again, it is uh, the capacity of the hook is dependent upon the usage of the crane, just like the CMAA standards are where you have class A, B, C, D, and E crane ratings. Uh, depending, you can have that 
frame and depend on what rating it is going to depend on the capacity of it. Okay, perfect. All right, we have a question coming in from Matias. When supplied with thread, I think he's saying with a thread, is there always a documented test load before delivery? I'm sorry, I, I missed. Is there a documented what? I mm, maybe is there a, is there a um, load testing done when it's supplied with threading? Maybe that's what he's saying. Yes. It, it's all it's all dependent upon the customer's request. Typically, when there is we supply a hook threaded, it's being a uh, it's being installed on a, ho uh, a hoist or a block that has not been tested, and the customer does their testing themselves. We can supply it as proof tested uh, upon request. Yes, okay. and we if we do supply as proof tested, then uh, we do supply a certification of that test with it. But in most instance, instances, the customer prefers to do their own testing when they assemble it onto their block. Okay. So they need the hook to test the block and everything, and why pay for testing twice if they've got to have the hook to test the block? That's correct. I didn't hear what you said, Troy. Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Um, Timson, so I can hear you better. You want to say what I said? Yeah, well, Troy, Troy brought up a very good point. The block has to be tested, so why pay for testing of the hook? Because the block cannot be tested without the hook on it. So you perform one testing, you assemble it onto the block, and you do one testing. That way you don't play for dual testing of the hook. Gotcha. So it, it is better in that situation to have it done at the customer site, but we can provide it if, if requested. Okay. Uh, yeah, the next question, yes. You're welcome, Matthias. Thank you. Um, this one comes from Jason. In what scenarios is the forging process not desirable? In what applications do you benefit more from utilizing the casting process? Troy, would you like to take that one? Um. Internal features. If you needed an internal feature in a, in a product, that's generally easier to cast than it is to forge. Um, it's easier to cast large parts. You know, not everybody has a hammer as big as us, so a lot of people have to cast. The Some details in forging or castings that you can't get in forging, as far as part features, primarily internal features. You know, if you needed a, a part that had internal passages for airflow through, like for a valve block or something, that might be better as a casting. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you to elaborate on the features, and and that's a good point, Troy. You can you can put a you can put a, a second cavity inside the, your your casting. I guess is, is what you're trying to say there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. So the next question is from Christoph. How big is the biggest hook that you can supply by size or weight? Well, actually, it's sad to say, but the largest capacity we can supply is 1,250 tons. It weighs approximately uh, 8,000 pounds. Oh my goodness! <laughs> now that's pretty. That's pretty and actually, uh, we have. I have a photograph. If you could get her information. Uh, Gisela, I'll send you a photograph of a lawn ornament that we have in front of our factory at STB with Prairie standing beside it. It's a 400 ton hook, and you can send it to the young lady. Perfect. I will do that. I will send it to Christoph. And the other question he has is, what is the highest proof load that you can apply? You know, we can go up to uh, 2x of the 1,250 ton. Uh, we, we, we don't do that internally, but we do have an external uh, shop in Hom, Germany. Any product that we manufacture, we do have a, either internally or capabilities of having those tested. So we could go to 1,250 tons. We could test it if, if required. Now, once again, let me uh, let me bring up. We can only test the product after it has been machined. We cannot test a unmachined shank hook. We do sell unmachined shank hooks as well as machined shank hooks. And uh, we're more than happy to supply you either one, but if you want it proof tested, it does have to be a machine or we can put a fixture into it. Okay, perfect. Perfect. On that question, we have one more one more polling question I'll do quick. We just want to see um, if any of you have requirements for shank hooks in your current business. Um, and then as soon as we're done with that polling question, we just want to gauge 
Uh, then we have another question that just came in from Frederick. Excellent, thank you very much. So while we're doing that, I'll ask the next question. Um, you said that CM is using DIN criteria for worn hooks. In effect, 5% of H2, H2 or H, I forgot what the other term is, while ASME B30.10 uh, hook standards specify 10% of the original section dimension. Is this equivalent? Is the ASME criteria considered safe by CM? Uh, we do follow the ASM, ASME criteria for all of our rigging products here in the U.S. Uh, since we do manufacture to DIN standards in, in Germany, uh, we follow the DIN standard for the inspection of our DIN hooks over there. There's two so, different. Um, ASME B3010 basically addresses hooks used in rigging, you know, stuff that goes on chain slings, wire rope slings, things like that, you know, that type of hook. And yes, um, that 10% wear requirement is safe for that. The, uh, the DIN standard more um, closely aligns with crane hooks, things that are actually an integral part of the crane itself. And, and that's a slightly different animal. Excellent. That's a very good question. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tim, for right now, we don't have any more questions. Can you go ahead and, and pull up the training slide just quick? Actually, there's another slide. Let me, um, yeah, let me let me speak to this. Yeah, okay, um, just two quick resources we wanted to share. And I'm going to send you all, a, we're going to send you all a follow-up email after the webinar, which includes a link to the webinar in case you want to share it. And I'll also send you a link to download our CM Heavy Duty Crane Hook brochure. And also a link to our most popular blog post on our blog, which actually was authored by Troy Raines called Forging Versus Casting, Which is Better, where he goes into some explanations and provides some additional resources, just so that you can read that if you're interested and want to go a step deeper. And then also, if you can go to the training slide, Tim, we just wanted to let you know, in case any of you are interested in some training coming up soon, we have some classes. Qualified Rigger Workshop in January, um, a Rigging and Overhead Crane Operator Train the Trainer class in January, along with Chain and Wire Rope Hoist Repair Certification and Chain Hoist Repair Certification. And if you're interested, you can go to our website, and I can also include this in our follow-up email, um, cmcodepot.com, where we have all of our training classes. And it looks like um, another question has come in. Uh, from Brian, do you supply hooks for all cranes or just your own models? No, actually, we, we do not supply hooks for any specific block itself. We can supply a hook for uh, for your dimensional requirements. We, we have a standard hook that are, is our DIN line, but we can also supply any additional hook that's required. Our DIN line are the most... Uh, uh, most competitive line due to the uh, mass forgings that we do. Uh, we, we forge thousands of these per year, but we can supply any dimension through the ability to freeform forge at our facility. So we can supply any hook. All we need is the dimensions that you need, and we can supply it for you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think that was the last question. So, Tim, can you please just go to the last slide, please? Perfect. Um, whoops. There we go. There we go. Just, yes, I just wanted to let you all know, if you go to cmworks.com in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see all of our social media links. We are very active on social media. We love to engage with you there. Um, we're on Twitter. All of, our safety, uh, all of our safety webinars are hosted on our YouTube channel. We have about 29 after today uh, that are there that you can look at for additional education. We're very active on Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, even Instagram. And that green button will take you right over to our blog where we now have, I think, about 170 articles posted over the last several years. And, and they're pretty technical in nature. So hopefully... If you want some additional resources, those are some that might help. So please connect with us there. Send us your pictures. Send us your questions. We love to hear from you, and we're very responsive on those channels. So, um, yeah, look us up. So we just want to say thank you to everyone. And like I said, be on the lookout for another email with a link to the recording that you can share with others within your company. 
we wish you all a, a great rest of the week and weekend, and uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.